Good evening, everybody. Welcome to week number one of our new series entitled Death to Selfie. Self-indulgent. Self-fulfillment. Self-gratification. Words that we use in our world today to describe what many people call one of the most self-centered times in world history. It's believed to be true by, by many people because of the, the technology that we have in our day and age, and it's really the, the theme behind, and just so we get this clear, let's maybe make sure we record this moment for prosperity's sake, and let's take a selfie here. Everyone want to get in the picture back there behind me? There we go. If you want to smile, photobomb it. Beautiful. Like your grandparents, if they saw that, would go, what in the world are you doing? Right? How self-centered are you? you? You take pictures of yourself. 20 years ago, if you had a camera, you, you wanted to turn it around on yourself, snap the picture, and actually developed it, would you? Pay money for that? No. The truth is, we, we recognize that, that in our world today, many people struggle and, and wrestle with being self-centered about self-fulfillment and self-indulgence and, and self-gratification. But the truth is, 2018 is, is no different in American society and culture than the 1970s. Uh, some of you here might be children of the, of the 70s. You do know that it was called the first me generation. We don't have anything over you. Self-fulfillment, self-indulgence, and, and being self-focused was an issue then. And in fact, if we page through the scriptures, we, we come across Genesis chapter 5. If you've uh, ever read what happened and transpired after Adam and Eve fell into sin uh, and, and the resulting consequences, you, you come across a genealogy of Adam and you find his great-grandson whose name was Lamech. Anyone ever read about Lamech? Uh, Lamech actually wrote a song and, and poetry and wanted the whole world to know that while everyone viewed his great-grandpa as the first murderer, he committed murder as well and and he should stand out for it too. Self-centered. A page a little further in the scriptures and you'll, you'll come across the, the book of Joshua and, and God's people went into the promised land after wandering for, for years in the desert and they walked, marched around that city called Jericho. You maybe learned the song and the walls came tumbling down and, and God said, there's not a single thing in this city that, that you are to take, but it's all to be consecrated to the Lord, to belong to me. But a man named Achan decided he wanted some for himself. Self-indulgence got the best of him. And so he took it and he hid it under his tent. And the next battle the Israelites went into, they lost, were massacred. And, and people lost their life because of that sin. Page a little further and you get to the, the man named David who was king. And in selfishness and for self-gratification, he, he looked out and saw a beautiful woman and said, bring her to me so I can sleep with her, even though she was another man's wife. And then in selfish arrogance and desire to cover up his sin, he had him murdered. And in tonight's section of Scripture, we're going to see a man named Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, who, who was so full of himself that he believed he could overcome what Jesus said was going to transpire and happen when confronted, and he denied his Savior. See, the truth is that since the fall into sin, this issue that we're going to talk about over the next several weeks is one that, that has reared its ugly head time and time again in the hearts not only of, of God's people, but all people. And as we dig into it, God really longs for us to see what we need to, to take to heart so that our heart is not separated from him. Jesus, 2,000 years ago, lived in a world that was self-centered and, and selfish and self-indulgent as well. And when Jesus and culture collided, he, he recognized the need to address the issue. That's what we're going to unpack over these next several weeks. We're going to take a hard look at words that, that Jesus spoke and situations that, that, that came up where, where Jesus had to address the issue of self and its ugliness in the human heart. And it's why it matters for us 
As a church, we talk about the roots that God wants us to plant deep down into the ground. That's why we gather, why we group, uh, why we long to grow outside of these walls. But to plant those roots down, what we have to do first, just like in any soil, is remove the rocks and the barriers that hinder their growth. And for us as Christians, what Jesus is going to describe and talk about over these many weeks are the things that we need to put to death. And we're going to see many different examples, but tonight is the foundational section that we're going to launch into in, in Mark's gospel. How many of you have read the, the gospel of Mark from beginning to end? Some of you have. might be a great exercise over the course of this series. Mark is one of four gospels in the, at the beginning of the New Testament, if it's unfamiliar to you. It's the shortest gospel. Uh, Mark was, was someone who uh, firsthand worked with people like the Apostle Paul. He, he worked with uh, Barnabas on missionary journeys, and he also was someone who was a, a great blessing and asset to the ministry of Peter. Many people believe the gospel of Mark uh, it is written by him, inspired by God with the, through the lens of Peter and his experiences. Uh, so the, the Gospel of Mark, while it's short, has a lot of quick bursts, uh, short sections that are, that are filled with miracles, and, and short sections of Jesus' words and teaching. Not the long uh, sections or sermons like Matthew records of the Sermon on the Mount, three long chapters of Jesus' teaching. Not the Gospel of John and all the I am statements that Jesus makes. Uh, and we're going to start with today, and we're going to continue on from this point in Mark's gospel after chapter 8, and we're going to see a transition in Jesus' ministry. So just so that you have in mind, Jesus, uh, his, his earthly public ministry was three years in length. And where we're at tonight is going to be the, the downturn, the beginning of the march towards Jerusalem, his, his, his suffering and his death. And it also marks a, a transition in, in Jesus' earthly ministry from, from one where many miracles were taking place to to more intense teaching with his disciples, less discussions about the kingdom of God, big picture, uh, salvation, Jesus is the, the son of God, to now more intense discussions about suffering and, and his death that was, that was getting closer. Uh, and, and in knowing that, you're going to see uh, why Jesus is going to be so intense in, in, in these sections. Because he knew his time on earth was short and he knew the rocks, the spiritual barriers that were real for his disciples and all of his followers that needed to be addressed because if they're not put to death, if they're not dealt with, if we don't have a, a death wish when it comes to our sinful self, it might lead to eternal death. And so we're going to begin that journey in Mark chapter 8 with a section of scripture that's going to be foundational for our entire series. We're going to, we're going to begin with chapter 8 verse 31. Jesus began teaching them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And then he must be killed and after three days, rise again. He spoke plainly about this. Now that last verse should stand out for you. If you've read anything of Jesus' conversations when he did some teaching, sometimes he spoke in parables uh, that people scratched their head on, like, Jesus, explain this to us. We don't quite understand. Uh, he sometimes spoke with, with images and illustrations, metaphors, things that, that people didn't quite relate to, didn't quite understand perfectly. Uh, so in this section, Jesus spoke plainly means he was right up front. He was very clear. There was no way that, that you could be mistaken by what he was saying. Uh, see, from this point forward in Jesus' ministry, he's getting his disciples ready for what's going to transpire. He wants them to understand very clearly what his mission and purpose was in coming to earth. That he was going to suffer. That he was going to be rejected by God's own people. That, that he was going, to, was going to die. Do you catch the word that, that Jesus used? Must. The Son of Man must suffer many things. Oftentimes here at St. Peter in the Core, we, we use this phrase, coming to church is a, a get-to, not a have-to. Uh, living our Christian life, it, it's not a have-to, it's a get-to because we love and, and celebrate the relationship we have with God. Understand what Jesus was, what was speaking about here, what, what he was going to continue to march toward was not a get-to. It was a have-to. Uh, over the course of the next few weeks, we're in a season that the Christian church calls Lent when we, when we focus on, on repentance and, and the struggle Jesus endured in our place, the suffering he went through, uh, the repentance that's required for the sinful heart. 
Uh, as we get closer to, to Holy Week, that last week of Jesus' life, we're going to see events transpire when he, when he marches in to songs of praise. But later that day, Jesus looks at Jerusalem and he weeps because he was going to be rejected by people that he loved. None of us would say rejection is a, is a get-to. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is going to be on his hands and, and knees and, and he's going to be in intense prayer with the, with the Father and he's going to beg, Father, if there's any way to take this cup from me, do it. Because Jesus knew it was coming. You all know what this is called? It's called anticipatory anxiety. When you see something on the horizon that's going to be painful and tough and difficult and you, you bear stress over that, it's not a get-to. But for Jesus, it was a have to. But Jesus understood that, that what was coming was a must. And he very clearly spoke it to the disciples, and they didn't miss it. Uh, look at how the next verse uh, tells us that as he spoke plainly about this, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Look at that verse for just a second and nothing in it should shock you. It shouldn't shock you that, that Peter is quick to speak and pull the trigger on rebuking Jesus, should it? In fact, if you put yourself in the shoes of the disciples, all of them had seen Jesus time after time be confronted. In fact, there were times when in his earthly ministry, people des desired to stone Jesus for things that he said. They, they picked up rocks. They were ready to, to, to throw them at him and put him to death. And Jesus walked right through crowds. He, he, he never allowed it to happen. And so when, when he says the Son of Man must suffer, you have to think Peter's saying, what are you talking about? You don't have to do that. You don't have to let that happen. We know you're bigger than that, stronger than that, and able to, to, to overcome it. But even more, it shouldn't shock us that, that Peter would say things like that because who of us isn't, isn't prone to desiring earthly pleasure and self-preservation? I just think if one of your friends came up to you and said, I'm going to suffer, it's going to be, it's going to be really ugly. There, there's going to be people in the world in the next year who are just going to hate me and I, and I don't know what I'm going to do. It's, it's going to be messy and my life is going to be overwhelmed with with so many bad things, you'd say, whoa, 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 stop. What are you talking about? There's, there's got to be a way out. Don't go there, Jesus. Don't go there, my friend. There, there's got to be a different way. Like, what are you saying? Because that's the human nature inside of each and every one of us. And while it doesn't shock us what Peter said and that he spoke, it, it wouldn't shock any of us as a, a Christian that, that Jesus rebuked him, right? Uh, to speak up and say, Peter, stop what you're saying. You, your, your idea of the kingdom of God, what you're looking for in a, in a Savior is off base. But, but even more, I want you to see what, who Jesus addressed. See, what Jesus recognized was that the, the person behind uh, Peter's self-focused heart, what was behind Peter's words of taking the easy road, uh, finding an alternative option, uh, was the same one in, in the garden who, who, who lurked behind the scenes and and convinced Adam and Eve to put self first, uh, to seek self-gratification and eating of the fruit, to be self-indulgent and, and try and find equality with God. Jesus understood that the, the one who was at work was the one who had tainted the, the flesh of all human beings at the fall. And, and so, so Jesus rebukes Peter, but he addresses Satan. He addresses Satan and says, get behind me. You have, you, you have in mind the things that are worldly, not the things of God. And I want you to see that, that over the course of the next several weeks, as, as we talk about specific things that Jesus addresses that we need to put to death, why they might be a struggle for us individually. And, and when they rear their ugly head, those words of Jesus will reveal why. Because when we're prone to them, when, when selfishness pops up, when self-indulgence is real, when, when self-gratification gets the best of us, it's done out of human concern. It's done with an identity focused on me and, and not God 
as my audience who I'm living for. You see, what Jesus needs us to understand, why, why he goes down this road and, and calls Peter out and, and, and lays out this truth uh, for his disciples first and foremost and us still today, is for Jesus there was a, a greater truth, his purpose and his mission. It's our first fill in the blank tonight if you're following along on our 922 church app or in your notes. Uh, here's the truth that, that Jesus understood and knew. Death for Jesus was a non-negotiable. Going to the cross was not negotiable. Avoiding the pain and suffering and, and rejection of, of his very own people was not negotiable. He, he knew the reason for which he came and he knew the mission that he had to accomplish. And there was no other way. He wasn't going to allow Peter and the disciples' false impression of, of the kingdom of God to deter him. He wasn't going to be willing to take the easy road and, and, and be selfish because he knew he had to die for your sins and mine, for, for all the sins of self-gratification that, that took place and have transpired since Adam and Eve. First state of the fruit. And while this truth is real, Jesus didn't stop there. Not only did he identify that death for him was non-negotiable, he went on with, 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 with further teaching to, to narrow the focus, to, to talk about what was going to be required for anyone who was going to follow after him. So for those disciples and, and all Christians to come, he, he addressed the issue of the heart, of self. Uh, here's where Jesus goes on as, as Mark 8 continues. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples. Before you go any further, that first section Jesus was talking to his disciples, he very rarely talked publicly beyond the disciples about having to suffer and to die. Uh, th that was a very specific message he, he focused in on with them. It wasn't something that, that he told them to, to declare to the world. It would have been hard for people to grasp and understand at that point. Uh, but here he opens it up. He brings other people in. And so what's going to follow in these words was not just for the 12 disciples. It wasn't just for people in an AP Christian class. It wasn't just for an honors course for the, the 12 disciples. Uh, no one said it was something that was uh, 101 Christianity. It was for not just the 12, but for the crowd. And, and he gathered them together and said this, whoever wants to be my disciple. I, I don't know where you're at with your faith walk. There might be people here tonight who, who, who aren't sure yet about Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And, and if that's the case, I'm so glad you're here. But, but Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants to to get in line and, and follow me, whoever wants to, to be a follower of mine, must deny themselves, must take up their cross and follow me. Jesus isn't just saying death is non-negotiable for him. He wasn't just identifying that in his future was a cross of great, great pain and torture He's also telling each and every person who, who longs to follow him, who longs to be a disciple, who, who longs to, to be step in step with Jesus, that, that they too must carry their cross. Do you see the words? Whoever applies to, to, to each and every one of us. It, it applies to me, it applies to you, it applies to your siblings, it it applies to your neighbor. It applies to your coworker. It applies to your cousin. It's, a, it's an all-encompassing word. Whoever, anyone, if you want to be a follower, you must. It's non-negotiable. It's, it, it, it's not optional. Uh, there's no other path. It, it's a must. And it involves denying oneself. It involves opposing one's sinful self. It, it, it needs to be a, a heart that challenges oneself and questions, uh, who am I following? Am I... Am I following the ways of men or am I following the ways of God? It must deny oneself and, and self-gratification and self-indulgence and, and self-preservation and carry a cross. Their cross. Those words got to make you at least clinch a little bit, right? Right? Because you know the cross. The cross is not just a tough leg day at the gym that, that'll hurt you two days later. The cross was an excruciating tool of torture that the, the Romans utilized to, to punish people, to put them to death slowly. 
where, where minute by minute, hour after hour, the, the life was sucked out of a person in a humiliating torture uh, where arms extended for all the public to see their life was ended. The cross was painful. The cross was torturous. The, the cross was, was something that was designed by the Romans to, to serve a purpose. Don't mess with us because this is what you'll get and you don't want any part of this. And that's what Jesus says comes along with discipleship. It's the truth that not only Jesus understood death was non-negotiable for him, but, but dying to self is non-negotiable for Jesus' followers. So let's be real. Jesus says dying to self, carrying a cross, will be hard. So what is it in your life that, that you're not willing to die to? That you're not willing to oppose? That you're not willing to challenge? What sin is it that you're minimizing or rationalizing and justifying and unwilling to repent of? What aren't you willing to put to death? Are you unwilling to, to die to sinful pleasure? Whether, whether lust that's in your eyes in viewing pornography, the lust of desiring self-medication and, and drugs and alcohol, what is it that, that your sinful flesh desires that you're willing to say, I, I don't think I want to die to that? Or maybe it's you're unwilling to put to death the, the desire for sinful power where you want to be authoritative and, and be in control and, and be the one who defines truth and, and lives how you want to live. Maybe it's wealth. Maybe it's the need for approval. And over the course of this series, we're going to identify all those that Jesus touches on. But, but I want you tonight to start wrestling with what is it that you're unwilling to die to because you know that in the process, it'll be painful. It, it might come with difficulty in your personal life. It might come with excruciating pain from the loss of friendship. It might come with ridicule because you're unwilling to, to die to the world and stand up for Jesus. Jesus says death is not optional when it comes to self. You might be sitting there going, but pastor, I, but why? <laughs> I hear Jesus saying it and I hear the what, but, but there's got to be a why behind it. Why would, why would that be the case? <laughs> Thankfully, Jesus goes on in this section to, to help us identify that. Let's look at verses 35 and, and 38. Jesus said, here's the why. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whatever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when, when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Jesus has a point, And maybe this will help you understand what he's saying there. To, to save, uh, if you want to save your life, he's talking about the earthly life that you have. If you want to save it, if you want to enjoy it, if you want to maximize it, you'll, you'll literally lose your life for eternity. Whoever loses their life here on earth for me, whoever denies self, carries cross, and, and deals with suffering will, will save it in light of the gospel. Uh, here, here's Jesus' point. Let me put it, let me put it in words maybe that, that you can relate to or resonate with you. See, when Jesus tells us that we must die to self, when it comes to dying, for you and for me, from a a spiritual perspective and what Jesus is talking about here, it's not a matter of if, but where. It's not a matter of if you will die. And the moment Adam and Eve ate from that truth, Jesus said, you will die, literally. Life is finite. Your, your days are numbered. The Bible is full of passages that, that identify it. And you know what? We live it. One of our pastors was in the hospital today with a with a family who, who lost a father after a battle with health and diseases and issues for, for many years. You've endured it. You've felt it. You've lost loved ones, sometimes unexpectedly, and, and other times you saw them withered away. Death is real. Dying is not an if. 
It's a reality unless Jesus comes back first. So he wants you to understand when it comes to dying, where do you want to die? Where do you want to spend eternity? That's what Jesus is talking about. You can have short-term pleasure here on earth. If you're unwilling to deny yourself, you'll enjoy the smiles of, of friends and family. You'll, you'll, you'll feel earthly pleasure because you haven't yet been removed from God. But when you breathe your last, long-term pain will be all that you experience. There won't be, there won't be smiles. There, there won't be hugs. There, there'll only be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's what the Bible describes as hell. So you don't have to die here on earth to self, but, but if that's the life you choose, Peter, if that's the life you choose, Pastor Tim, if that's the life you choose, St. Peter in the core, then you lose it for eternity. But if, but if you, you choose to, to lose your life here, if you oppose yourself, if you wrestle and struggle with self, if you, if you set aside and put to death the sin of self and carry a cross, you'll, you'll, you'll have short-term suffering. You'll endure painful experiences. You'll, you'll probably face the rejection of friends and the ridicule of others. But the moment you breathe your last, you will be eyes wide open to the the greatest of joys and happiness of arms wide open God who, who smiles at you and offers you eternal life. Short-term pain here on earth and denying oneself will, will lead to long-term pleasure. That's what, what Jesus says. And that's his point. There are some of you here who, who might be new to Christianity and you're, you say, but this doesn't line up with what I, what I know, what I hear. There's a reason because it's not the message of the world. I don't know when this message starts resonating with people, but, but part of me this last year has, has come to believe, and as I examine this for today, it, it begins when, when young people gain their independence. And as my son was getting ready to go to college, you know what I heard a lot of people say to him? I'm so excited for you. you you're you're going to so love going to college. You only live once. Enjoy it. Maximize it. Experience everything the world has to offer. And, and there's a part of me that was going, yeah, do it, dude. I remember college. It was awesome. And I'm like going, no. <laughs> As this week started, like, no. There's a lot to like about the experience. There's a lot that he's enjoying. But, but you know how that creeps in when you, when you get to college and someone wrongs you? Don't carry the cross of, uh, of forgiving, which is hard and and setting aside yourself and, and, and holding a grudge, but rather, let them pay for it. Don't deny yourself the pleasures of the flesh. You know, indulge a little bit. Dabble around. Find a couple girls if you want. You, you only live once. And don't speak up in class when the, when the professor teaches something that is in the face of God. Just be quiet. Don't tell the truth when you get confronted and you, you got caught. And definitely don't throw your friends under the bus along with it because you might lose friends. It never stops, does it? I still wrestle with it and, and I have to believe you wrestle with it too because this side of heaven, none of us can perfectly deny self. Because that, that same devil who was lurking behind Peter speaks the same to you and me. Be concerned about the things of this world. Preserve yourself. Thankfully, that is not why Jesus came. <laughs> Jesus came because he knew you and I could, could not on our own put self to death. And, and so you know what he did? He went to the cross. He... he he, he gave his life. He, he literally endured that pain so that you and I would never be forsaken for eternity. He literally lost his, his, his human life. He faced being forsaken by God. He, he gave up self 
so that you and I might be saved. It's why the beautiful picture of what, of what Jesus came to do for every time that, that you and I have failed, for every time that, that you and I have fallen, for every time that, that self won, that we preserve self, that we indulge self, Jesus went to the cross to, to undo what, what we've done. And, and now through the power of the Holy Spirit, we know our life has been changed, our eternal life has been changed, our, our old self has been eradicated. Literally, the Bible tells us we were buried with Jesus, we died with Jesus, and, and we've been raised to new life. This is possible with his help and with his power because of of who he is. And here's what, what we know to be true. When we die because of Jesus, this will be our truth and our story. I'm the resurrection and the life, Jesus said. The one who believes in me, the one who knows me as, as God himself, the son of God who came to earth, perfect life, who, who never caved to the pressures of the devil. You, you know he didn't desire the the riches of the world when tempted, but he said, no, I'm going to serve God and serve him only. He did that for you and me. He, he went to the cross and he died in our place so that whoever believes in, in him will live even though they die and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And Jesus died to, on the cross so that, that you and I would not die for eternity. He, he, he died so that when we breathe our last breath, and while physically we might cease to, to be, our heart might stop beating, our breath might stop coming out. Well, physically, we, we die. We, we don't literally die. <laughs> we cross over from life to life. Jesus put himself to death so that you and I would never experience the torture, ultimate torture, the cross of being forsaken by God for eternity. And so Jesus says, here's why. You need to put self to death. Because <laughs> I came to give you life and life to the full. Do you want to enjoy 75 years of, of earthly pleasure and an earthly crown or do you want an eternity of a crown? Do you want an eternity of God's embrace? Do you want an eternity of, of riches that, that this world cannot offer? Jesus wanted to make sure his disciples understood this. Uh, it, it's one more verse that, that we're going to fill in. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and, and, and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? You know the answer to the question, right? Jesus, rhetorically speaking here. What good is it if you have everything this world has to offer? If you have power and prestige, if you have popularity and fame, if you have a, 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 such a long list of friends uh, that, that, that the world can't count it, if you have all the, the riches and all the wealth and can enjoy every indulgence this world has to offer, what good is it for you to have it all but lose the one thing that matters? Nothing. It's why he wants you to put to death self and, and while there might be pain and struggles this side of heaven, it might bring rejection and, and, and humiliation. It might bring struggles uh, physically. It's not eternal. And Jesus knew there wasn't anything that you or I could give in exchange for our soul. We could amass wealth and friends and popularity, but if we live for the approval of others and, and not for the approval of the king, we lose it all because there's not a thing we could give not an amount of money we could pay that can pay the price for sin, but Jesus paid it. You and I have, don't have the ability to offer it, but, but he did. So I need you to come back these next few weeks because I don't want you to forfeit your soul. I don't want you to, to think that you can dabble in Jesus and, and move the needle a little bit forward, but, but not give it all up. Jesus doesn't, doesn't say that's possible. He says there's only one way. It, it requires denying oneself, opposing oneself, challenging oneself, turning from sin, repenting of, of things that are hard, and, and carrying crosses. That'll be difficult. Over these next few weeks, we're going to have death to blank. We're going to fill it in every, every week. Jesus in his culture is going to identify the things people wrestled with, some that we just hinted at tonight, but but I want you to wrestle this, this week. I want you to think about what areas you struggle with because I want us to be a church where, where, where we're willing to say no more. Here's Jesus' underlying uh, point it, it, that's going to come back time and time again in this series. Why, why put death to selfie? Why wrestle with these things and challenge our sinful heart and oppose it? God will put up with a lot of things in the human heart. 
But being second isn't one of them. You may have, may, may have been watching the Olympics the last few days and, and you see people striving for, for medals. How many of them are, are there that, that are awarded? Three. Three. Now, people who win silver medals get ecstatic. <laughs> for many of them, it means thousands of dollars as, as a bonus from, the, from their nation. It means fame. It must, means prestige. Getting a second silver medal, second is a, is a great thing. It's a celebrated thing. You know what? Receiving the second medal of your heart by, from God's perspective is not celebrated. He wants to be in the gold position. He, he wants to be first place on the podium. And he deserves it. He's worthy of it. Because for Jesus, death was not negotiable. You know why? Because you were in the gold medal position of his heart. You were the one he came for. You were the, the sins he died for. The, you were the person that, that he set aside himself and humbled himself and became obedient to a cross so that you might have life eternal, life to the full. Self-gratification and, and self-indulgence, the, the world would say, are, are great things. But Jesus didn't. And neither will we anymore. May God bless us to be a church that's willing to wrestle and, and talk about these tough issues and, and put self to death, thankfully knowing that we have a Savior who died for us and paid the price for our sins so that we might have life Life with him eternal. Whoever will lose their life for me, Jesus said, but awesome and amazing news, whoever carries his cross, save it. Because Jesus saved it. May God bless us as we consider all the things we need to wrestle with in the, in the weeks ahead uh, to be the, the follower that he calls us to be. Let's pray. Uh, dear Jesus, we know that in the weeks ahead, we're all going to wrestle with tough issues. And, and none of us is the same. Uh, for some of us, some of us we're going to need to wrestle with putting death to power and prestige. For some of us, it's going to be needing to put death to approval of others and not living for the audience of one. For, for some of us, Lord, money and, and our jobs and our families take priority over you. And, and your word's very clear. There's no, there's no second place uh, in, in, in your reality for, for, for us when it comes to where you stand. You need to be first. Uh, you're, you, you, O Lord, came to earth so that, so that we might live. You died so that, that we wouldn't be separated from you for all eternity. And you call us to say, it's going to be tough, it'll be difficult, and, and it'll be hard. It'll be a cross. But it'll be worth it. It'll be the crown of life that is received for all eternity. So, Lord, incline our hearts not to, to live for short-term pleasure, which leads to long-term pain, but instead, let us live in light of, of the pain that you endured and the cross that, that you carried and the new life that you won for us by rising uh, to see that we need to put self to death. It's not negotiable because what you have to offer on the other side is so amazing and life-changing for eternity. Lord, I pray you inspire your church to plant deep roots to remove those rocks so that we can be the followers that, that you've called us to be, looking forward to life forever with you. Thank you, Lord, for the victory you won and the forgiveness that is ours. Amen.